Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to episode 40 of the On Air Advocate. We're at the On Air Advocate. We look to provide education, support, and empowerment for all of those with different abilities, mental and medical illnesses, and their caregivers. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Tammy Flynn, and I'm the host and producer of the On Air Advocate. And I am super excited that either you are joining us on this live or if you are catching it on the replay. Now, as always, if you think the content we're talking about today could be relevant, please share the love and hit the share button. Now, as most of you know, we have been going through the whole world of chronic pain and pain management in our series for over the last two and a half weeks. And so I am super excited today to bring another layer and aspects into that with Mr. Greg Jones, who is a fourth year naturopathic medical student at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Arizona. Welcome, Greg. All right. Hello and good afternoon. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. So before we get started, Greg, um, kind of diving into the world of chronic pain and pain management, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what led you into the path of going into naturopathic medicine? Okay. Um, without giving you my full life story, which I can do, but who has time? A lot of years to cover there. Um, I grew up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I um, left there when I was 17, joined the Navy. I enlisted in the Navy. I was a nuclear submarine officer. Uh, sorry, I was a mechanic at the time. I mm -hmm. uh, did that for a few years, and I was accepted to an officer program. And then I uh, went to the University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, where I majored in biomedical engineering. Um, I graduated and went back to the military around 2001 and uh, did nuclear engineering again. And so I finished my career. So I did a full 20 years in the military. So uh, this is legit gray hair. This is not uh, a style thing. I earned these Fashion. all that time. <laughs> yeah, it's ex exactly what I call it. It's like, yeah, I need more B vitamins or something. But, um, and for me, once I got out, I, I always had this plan that I was going to, you know, get on with the military, graduate, go to pharmacy school, become a pharmacist you know, hang at a Walgreens or something at a hospital and help people get the right you know, medications for their conditions. Like I just, I didn't know like this world existed. And so um, as I got closer to, uh, I took a job out here uh, with Honeywell as aerospace engineering, in the aerospace engineering world. And as I got closer to applying for uh, pharmacy school, I just realized it wasn't exactly for me. It wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. And the purpose wasn't there for me. And I actually almost accidentally found our program. I went to the graduation um, back in 2014. Oh, it was it 2013? Man, time is, is all coming together, mixing together. But I believe it was a 2013 graduation. And I was like, oh, wait, there's this field where they're treating people with natural modalities and finding ways to get people better, like really better and not just treating mm -hmm. the symptoms and focusing on the root cause and all these great things. And I was like, this is it. This is the thing I've been looking for. And um, I just changed my path and, and, and jumped feet first and did what, I, did what I had to do. And here I am, you know, so it's, uh, it's fortuitous because it's been, you know, life changing for me and, and just inspiring to see like what natural body medicine right. can do and the differences it can make. And now you're in your, your last year. So how much longer, when is, when is graduation? It is December 22nd of this year, um, seven months or so. I think it's like 230 something days. Like I don't have the count. I don't want to, I like seven months. Seven you months sounds better. 200 and some days though. So you're kind of it's, it's, it's scarily close. It's, it's scary close, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But here we are, you know, getting close and not too far away. Right. And I know that in our conversations we have had off of the air, we kind of wanted to take this into two parts with you. Mm -hmm. And yes. so that first part that you think is so incredibly important and to share with the audience is more diving into and exploring and understanding pain. Right. It's correct? Right. Yes, indeed, okay. indeed. And so um, kind of the genesis of that is, uh, again, I am a student. And so, mm -hmm. um, and while, you know, we learn a lot and we learn how to treat things like, you know, without a license, you can't just come on here and say, hey, take this or take that and this will help you feel better. And so, but even if I could, I think it would be important to look at, you know, what is pain? What is the purpose mm -hmm. of pain? Like how do people, um, you know, how do they live their life in pain? How does it affect them? Because I think in order to really treat a person, I think you need to know what's really going on. 
right. and not just in the um, pathophysiology and etiology and all things we learn in school. That's great. It's awesome. And we need to know that. But it's just not that simple for someone who's been in pain, you know, four or five, 10, 15 years where they've been in medication. So I think we need to get the understanding of what's going on with them. So I, what, what I envisioned was, you know, I'm here talking today and I can talk a little bit more of the background and, and my experience with pain and some of the things I've learned on um, how it affects the daily living, daily lives of, of people mm-hmm. in pain. And then maybe in the future, uh, I can hopefully invite one of my uh, naturopathic doctor friends or uh, one of my physician friends and, and, and get them on here and say, hey, let's do this together and talk about some basic things. Not Obviously, you would, you know, they can't just say, hey, this is how we fix it. But here's some right. things you look at, like dietary. Yeah, here's, here's some diet changes, here's some lifestyle changes, here's some supplements, here's some things that you can look at, you know, as you're getting better and as you're seeing your physician, as you're going down the path. But I didn't want to, like, go down that path, you know, here today as a student because I didn't want people to be like, oh, this medical student said take fish oil and I took fish oil and now I'm sitting here like, oh, no. Right, well, and I think that one of the most important things that we always have to remember is that we have to, things work different for everyone. And so, you know, at the Honor Advocate, our whole goal is to present different types of modalities, different types of things that have worked for other people along their journey. So you're talking about, you know, pain from your own aspect of you dealing with pain on, you know, a regular basis and things that have maybe worked for you. And sometimes, you know, with that, we come up with things to try that work for some and don't work for others. But, you know, I'm excited to take it to that, you know, that second step as well to kind of throw some things out of the toolbox that way. Um, But as we explore pain, can you get a little bit more into that? I know we were talking before about like the acute pain, chronic pain, and really understanding even what pain is. Right, exactly, exactly. So um, if I seem fidgety, and I probably do, is because uh, I'm telling you this morning that I truly thought this was going to be like a phone call (laughs) conversation, and I wasn't going to be on Facebook Live. And I was like, I totally did not see this coming. And this is cool. But it's, it's strange in, in, in its own way. But I got this. We're going to get through this. Um, so, it, you know, kind of going back to my story a little bit, when I first got to SCNM, um, I don't know if we even talked about that. Yeah, I'm a fourth year student at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in Tempe, mm-hmm. Arizona. And uh, when I got there, uh, like most students, it's like you come in with a, an idea of this is what I want to do. And I got there and I was like, okay, I think it's going to be oncology, but it may be cardiology, but those are the two things. I didn't see pain management is something that I had an interest in or a real interest in. I had a sports medicine interest, but I still had this, um, <clears throat> this gap in my mind between the two. I didn't really see the correlation in the beginning. But as I got further in the program and actually started, you know, being able to sit in on shifts in, uh, in the clinic and get into clinic as a student, I was like, man, pain is, is everywhere. It's bad. And, you know, you see people coming in, and you see how it affects them. It's like, you know what, this is an area that I may be able to, uh, you know, affect more people. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the you know, the current status of of chronic pain in America. I mean, we're talking about about 100 million people suffer from chronic pain. That's almost a third of the country. It's a lot of people. And I know it's varying degrees of it and it affects, you know, varying degrees of disability with it. But that's like four times the number of diabetes patients, you know, and that's almost 10 times the number of of cancer patients. That's a lot of people. That's one in every three people you see are in some sort of pain they've been dealing with for a long time. And, and when we say a long time, most of the professional organizations will define chronic pain as recurrent pain that's about three to six months uh, in length that adversely affects a person's well-being. So I think that's kind of a good distinction is like it's not, it's more than just this nagging pain. It's affecting how you live your life, you know. So it's a big number of people and a lot of people to address. And so when you look at the, the dictionary definition of pain, it'll talk about it's physical suffering uh, or discomfort caused by illness or injury. And that's really just simple. Like pain is pain. We know it. It's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. It sucks. It's like, ah, oh, I'm in pain. Um, but back in 1973, a bunch of people way smarter than me. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't born in 73, so really smarter than me. And, and, and they, you know, they define pain. And so they define it as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. And I read this definition. I was like, okay, what are they saying? But there's a lot to unpack there. And uh, I kind of looked at it in three parts to help me understand it. Uh, Number one, with pain being a sensory and emotional experience. So it's easy, at least to me, to understand the, you know, the sensory part of it because, you know, we've all felt pain. We've all, you know, cut ourselves or burned ourselves or frostbite. You're in Milwaukee, right? Yes. Or uh, Milwaukee. Is that the right pronunciation of it? (laughs) (laughs) So you're there. And I grew up in Chicago, so I get it. Cold can be painful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we understand that 
you know, you get that, you know, you know, it's uncomfortable, but the emotional part of it was kind of eye opening for me because it's, um, you know, the emotional part is where it, that's what affects and, and translates to a behavioral response and, and that change of behavior to deal with the pain. So it's like, okay, I know that this hurt. I don't want to feel it again. I'm not going to do it again, you know, right. or it may be, okay, this affects how I live my life. And so I started asking myself, should we be looking at the emotional and the behavioral component of the pain along with the physical sensation of it? I think they all kind of come together and they all relate it. Okay. So the next part of that, I was like, okay, actual or potential tissue damage. Now, you know, most people, you don't have to go to medical school to know that pain is associated with tissue damage or an injury, a cut, a sprain, a burn, a fracture. That's pretty straightforward. But I felt that this definition acknowledges that pain can also, you know, be a result or a response to potential damage. For example, let's say you, you know, you burn your hand or um, you get close to a fire, then you remember that experience. So you may feel that pain, that sensation of pain as you get close to fire again, or your hand get close to a fire again. So you know not to do it. And we'll talk about that some more when we get into the purpose of pain. And so the last part, you know, this is the part I spent some time thinking about. And they talked about pain and described in terms of such damage. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Right. You know, you know, are we saying the pain can be experienced without, without tissue damage, without structural damage? Like, what, is, what do those terms mean? The, so, maybe the mental aspect of it? Yeah. And I think it's the subjective nature of it. Like, you know, you can... You know, you can feel pain without an injury or a threat of injury. You know, you think about um, something that happened in the past, especially with neuropathic pain, you know, like you have nerve damage or uh, we'll talk about diabetes more later where you had this and it was in the past, the damage per se may be resolved. You know, let's say you were diabetic and now your glucose is you know, back to normal. You're living a good life and you still have these issues. That damage is still there. So it becomes more of, you know, you still can describe the pain. You still feel the subjective nature of it. Now, if, if that's unclear, it may be because it was slightly unclear for me, but I think what they were trying to say is that, you know, just because we can't describe it in just this, it's a scale of eight out of 10 or it's burning or it's crushing pain. That doesn't mean it's not pain, you know? So, okay. And so now I think with that, you know, it's, it's, it makes it easier for me personally to define pain. It's this personal experience arising from actual injury or potential injury or previous injury, you know, that should that should have been resolved you know so it's like we know that something started it it hasn't been resolved it's there so now we need to look at okay what's the purpose of it so i know that was a little bit of rambling i don't you know no, that's good that's good so um going into purpose mm -hmm. um going into the purpose of it um and i know that this in the last maybe three weeks we've talked a lot about too you know for that that mental part of it is that sometimes when you do have chronic pain you've had it for so long and like you're starting on pain medications all those different things how your brain does some different tricks with you after a while as well you know where okay. it's shooting off it's shooting off things saying that you know you still have pain but you're it's really not pain it's a lot of fog and whatnot going on so we have we broke that down a little bit too so for purpose um the purpose of pain or purpose within pain explain that to me okay um and this is where i like to say like you know like most people don't like pain as a most there are okay. some people that enjoy it not that kind of podcast but <laughs> You know, but we know that is, is, is not a good thing, you know, and in my opinion, my experience, pain, it's, you know, at its most, you know, primal level is about survival and self-preservation. Mm -hmm. um, and you think about it, you know, just imagine like being unable to feel pain. I know it sounds like a superpower and the Avengers and all stuff came out to be great not to feel pain. Right. But in the real world, like it's necessary. You know, you think about and going back to the, the, the child analogy, it's like, you know, a kid gets hurt. They feel the pain and stop doing whatever it is that made them hurt. And they're very careful not to do it again. And you learn this, right. you see this in babies, you know, like, okay, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it again. That hurt. I'm not putting my finger in there again, mm -hmm. you know, and without that ability to experience pain, that kid's just going to do it again and keep getting hurt, you know, and, and that's something we don't want. And, you know, kind of going back to the diabetic example is, you know, when diabetes progresses, you know, that person can lose their sense of touch, you know, they can't feel pain, they can't feel temperature in their feet. So how bad would that be if you burn your skin or develop an ulcer or fracture and you don't even know it happened? Right. You know, so, you know, and that's why, like, although pain, I don't like it. I've been there. I don't want to experience, but I'd rather have a signal from my body, that alarm system that's saying, right. hey, so, don't do that again. You don't want to feel that again, you know. So, you know, to summarize, pain is essential for injury, pre injury prevention and protecting the whole body while it's healing. So it's there to help us. Um, and we'll talk about adapt, adapt. Oh, God. Sorry, coffee break. Talking too much. 
Hmm. It's Friday. It and is Friday. You know on Friday, anything goes. I mean, really. Yeah. Well, you know, well, almost. Oh, man. It's tough in med school. I don't really know. Fridays are not Fridays in the traditional sense, but we'll talk about adaptive and maladaptive pain as we get a little further down into the talk and like mm -hmm. how we, you know, respond to pain. You know, it's like, okay, you feel it, but what's next after that? So we'll get into that. Okay. Still there? Yes, I'm still here. I know. Are you ready to cut this off? Is that I know. We're, I was, done? I'm, we're all I'm done waiting. here. I'm waiting on that. And I know we were talking a lot um, before um, we got on the show about mm -hmm. sometimes some of those, you know, the daily effects, you know, mm -hmm. and what it does to us on a daily basis. Okay. Really? Yeah. Let's talk and about And how many other layers that fold all into that as well. And mm -hmm. that trickling down effect. Um, where we go from having the pain, but because of the pain, a lot of times, you know, we experience things like we were talking about, you know, depression and it affects mm -hmm. our workplace environment and not being able to work, which then leads to being, you know, as you were saying, you know, sad about obviously self-worth and just makes the depression mm -hmm. worse. And so there's so many layers to, you know, the pain world. You know, I mean, it's not just right. having the pain. It's and then also your family, relatives, people that are around you. Um, mm -hmm. We talked a lot about over the last couple of weeks to their perspective of it. Like, are you really dealing with pain? Like, how much pain are you in? Like, sometimes they right. sometimes there's that disbelief, like that you're really in that sort of pain when it's something that um, it's kind of like an invisible disability. You right. know, where you can't see always on the outside that someone is experiencing it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's true. And um, now I'm going to I'm going to get there, but I, I want to back it up yeah. just a little no, bit. That's Cause I, great. I do, yeah, because what I don't want to miss out on is, um, you know, because when we say pain, I feel like that's a really it's a very simple word to say, you mm -hmm. know, four letter word, just pain. But like pain comes in so many forms and it's so complicated. You know, it's not as simple as this hurts. And even as a, you know, student clinician, like you know, that's one of the more difficult questions that we right. get to ask the patient is like, hey, can you describe the pain? You'd be surprised how many people just can't describe it. Mm -hmm. And even when they do um, describe it, it's like, it's never just like, oh, it's burning. It's like, oh, well, it's, it's burning when I do this or stabbing when I do this and it's dull when I do this. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's only happens at night. And mm -hmm. My bones hurt when it's raining outside and, you know, and the mailman mm -hmm. run the doorbell and my eyes hurt, you know, and it's just all mm -hmm. these different things where it's like, how do you really describe it? So it's very complicated. And we're talking about, the nervous system we're talking about nerve endings in our body you know regions of the brain and also the pathway that goes back from the brain to the body so it's not just a one-way street of pain you know that's how we, we adapt to it and so uh if it's okay i do want to i'm not gonna this is the part where i would put people to sleep i'm gonna keep this really really like high level but i do want to kind of talk about you know the, the four types of pain from what i understand you know okay. This is the point where i say like i studied this dang it y'all are gonna hear it so <laughs> i'll keep it really really, really high level. So um, four types of pain that I want to go over. And the first is nociceptive. And that is more of your, you know, noxious stimulus. You know, when I say noxious, I don't mean like toxic or a bad smell. It's more of heat, cold, surgical trauma. Uh, we, most people have a high pain threshold for that. So this is where, let's say, and I, I know I keep going back to the burn example. You, you know, you touch fire, it starts in the body, that signal is, is sent to the spinal cord. And then onto the brain, and pain is perceived by the location and severity. So this is like, hey, something is hot. This is where it is. Get mm -hmm. your hand off of it, you know. And it's it's a fast response, but it's not the fast response. You, and you probably felt yourself like you touched something and you didn't realize. It may have taken you three seconds to realize, oh gosh, I just stepped on glass or something, you know, mm -hmm. or I just, you know, have had my hand on a piece of ice for a while. So those things are a little bit slower acting. Um, then there's the inflammatory pain. And inflammatory pain from inflammation, like the easy example is an ankle sprain. So you're playing basketball, you're running, you're jumping, you twist your ankle, and you know it right away. There is no right. delay time. It's like, that hurts. I'm done. I'm going home. Mm -hmm. You know, so a very fast response, a hypersensitive, spontaneous reaction. You know, you're getting enzymes and chemical signals that are saying, hey, this is what the injury is. Let's stop doing it. And what's interesting about that is that it's not just the sensitivity to the, the stimuli, it's also protecting you against further damage. So it's like you almost immediately start limping or you won't, like say if you hurt your knee, you're not going to keep bending your knee at that point. You know, right. You're going to protect yourself. So uh, it's interesting because I read some theories about the inflammation, if it's not treated or it's not dealt with, how that actually can put you on the path of chronic pain. 
it's like, hey, you know, you've never really dealt with it. And, you know, something's getting maladapt- maladapted and now you're in a chronic pain situation. And that's, you know, into the, you know, the more theoretical parts of it. Mm-hmm. And so quick sidebar is like, I wish I can sit here and say, this is what causes chronic pain. I don't right. know if anyone can really say that because there's so many factors that, factors that go into it. Mm-hmm. And even, um, you know, nociceptive pain, inflammatory pain, they're also intertwined. You think about osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis and cancer. It's not just this one thing. Um, the next one is neuropathic pain or nerve pain. So that's when you get damage or alteration to your uh, peripheral, which is a nervous system not attached to your spinal cord or your central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. Mm-hmm. And they can be affected by injuries, viral infection, diabetes, uh, multiple sclerosis, so many things. And there's also a low, a low pain threshold with that. So if you you know, I always think the, the, the funny bone examples, your ulnar nerve, when you yeah. think about when you, when you bump that, you know it like right away. It's like, okay, that's not cool. Don't like that. There's nothing funny about this funny bone. <laughs> Let's keep going. Right. You know, so again, with that, you know, that pain should resolve once the nerve, you know, everything's back in balance. But sometimes it can persist. And now you're looking at, you know, chronic you know, neuropathic pain. <sighs> are you bored yet? No. Are we, are we good? No, are we good? it all in. Uh-uh. We're going right, to have I'm, a test after this. People don't we, know. We're having yeah. a quiz. We have a quiz. I actually have it ready. And if you <laughs> don't pass it, you have to watch this again. That's the, the rule. Um, the last one, which is a little bit more uh, harder to quantify, is central pain or central pain augmentation. So that's where there's no noxious, there's no inflammatory, there's no nerve damage identified. It's that you are responding abnormally to a normal signal. So it's like, okay, I, there's no real thing. It's like, okay, there's no injury there. There's nothing that you can just see via testing right away. And a lot of times people will classify fibromyalgia in this condition, in this, in this category, migraine headaches, non-cardiac chest pain. So that the chest, the pain that comes with anxiety, uh, IBS, uh, irritable bowel syndrome could be considered in this. Um, and although they do, if you look at like research and studies, they'll say these are central you know, pain syndromes, but they kind of fall in several categories. It's not just that one thing. You know, and I wish it were this easy in real life. I wish it'd be like, hey, you have nerve pain. Let me treat this and right. boom, you're good. Or you've got this and it's, it goes away. And I just have not, even as a student here, I just haven't really seen that very often in very right. few cases. Let me do this one thing and you're good. And which, which is interesting because you know, when I first got in the clinic uh, last year, you know, I was like most students. I'm super gung-ho. I'm like, man, I'm about to come here and save everybody. Just watch. Wait till they get a hold of this treatment plan I'm putting together and, you know, and I would put it together and, you know, you run it through the attending physician and say, Hey, go with that. And the patient comes back two weeks later. You're like, Hey, are you healed? Did you just run a marathon? They're like, nah, I'm mm-hmm. pretty much just a little bit better. And you're like, Oh, I suck. Right. They didn't just get cured right away. And because it's more complicated than just changing one thing. And, you know, and there's a lot of life, lifestyle changes and understanding that, you know, if someone's been in pain for five, 10 years, the probability of us like getting them better in five, 10 minutes, it, it just, right. just probably isn't going to happen. And so understanding that, you know, it's a commitment, not just from the patient, but I think from us and as future healthcare professionals, we have to be committed as well. Sorry, I'm hopping off my soapbox no. there. All right. <laughs> No, and I think that as we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, it's about looking at the whole person, all the different aspects, you know, Mm -hmm. of them, you know, because sometimes you may have lower back pain. And if we're just looking at the back, we're going to miss the big picture. It could be stemming completely from somewhere else. And then looking at your lifestyle, you know, your activities Mm -hmm. that you're doing on a regular basis, as well as your mindset through that time. You know, and I think that's why there has been a lot of focus on developing more pain management clinics and where, you know, you're getting the whole picture together where you're having sometimes, I know in the child setting, um, they always, if you're in pain management, you are in more of a pain management clinic setting where you have a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a regular MD, your pain management doctor um, to make sure that you're looking at all aspects of what are going on with the patient. That. That's uh wow, that's really cool. You know, mm-hmm. that's actually, you know, yeah. this is more you're saying that's more in the pediatric world. And I think yeah. that's super I don't important. know. Um in talking though this last couple of weeks, I feel like some of the MDs, as well as when I was talking to some people who are chiropractors, whatnot, a lot of them are really looking at the whole picture. So different yeah. testing, which I'm sure that you guys have talked about that you can utilize in looking at someone's whole body and whatnot. So mm-hmm. just kind of more of that whole scope. Um, is good, really good. important to not miss things, you know, yeah, that good. are going and that's on. one of our, um, 
And that's one of our principles, you know, one of our naturopathic principles is, you know, treat the whole person. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, like day one, like you need to know that before we even start. So I, I can appreciate that it's not just something that, and it shouldn't be isolated to us. I've never been a, the type of person to be like, hey, you know, we do this and no one else does because I feel like if you're going to be a healthcare professional, I feel like you should, everyone should be doing that. And I know that it's, right. it's slow, it's slow moving sometimes and, you know, time restrictions and all that stuff. But that is really encouraging to, uh, to hear that. Um, I think even uh, at this point, you know, as we're kind of like progressing, like I, I know earlier you kind of asked me about the, the um, you know, the, the ramifications of pain, but like, I feel like to get to that point, I do want to make a distinction between acute and chronic pain. I do want to make awesome. sure that, uh, yeah, because like at the end of the day, like, you know, right, I, to I'm really not, decipher between the two, because sometimes people, they don't know, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's chronic and what really defines chronic. Right, exactly. And how we respond differently to it. So you know, when we think acute pain, you're thinking immediate, like, hey, again, like we're talking about that example, something's wrong, where it's happening, you know, what are we going to do? And so that acute pain leads to the stress reaction or uh, more commonly known as a fight or flight reaction. So you're going to have an increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate, uh, breathing rates increase, uh, increase, you're more alert, you're fast. So you're getting out of danger ASAP, you're getting out of there, like, look, this has to stop, I'm going to make it stop right now. And again, um, alluded to it earlier, it leads to that protection, that guarding, that reaction to prevent worse injury. And that's where the adaptive part comes in. It's that sensation of pain is letting you know there's something physically wrong and we need to stop it. So you're adapting to it. You're going to stop doing what makes you know, the pain occur. Uh, now, most minor injuries, uh, most acute injuries, you know, they have the we have the potential to heal naturally within three months or so. Longer or shorter, depending on the location, the severity, and the age of the patient. A lot of factors are going to healing, but... In general, in those other factors, you think diet, stress level, environmental effects. So there's a lot that goes into it. But, you know, in general, most minor injuries should, you know, resolve with, you know, with we got to help the body along diet. We'll talk about right. that more in the next uh, next talk. But, you know, something's minor. It shouldn't take you two years to get over. Right. Um, and so that's, that's where it's kind of cool. Another thing that drew me to naturopathic medicine is like, hey, you know, we have, you know, we being people, humans, we have the ability to heal. Like it's there. It's how do we remove that obstacle? How do we get rid of that thing that's preventing us from getting better? Um, you know, and so the thing about it is that we can heal naturally, but we got to make sure we're in the right environment to do it. And so, but you can't ignore it. You can't say, oh, I'm going to be good. I'm this all, you know, I, I'm a human. I got all this stuff and you don't do anything about it. And now you're in the path of, of chronic pain because you didn't address it. So, right. And that's where healthcare professionals and, and, and that's the doctors and physical therapists and, you know, people that understand this world, that's why they're so important to help guide you down that path of, hey, this is something, you know, you can rest and recover or something that you need to address more and more soon. So, right. Uh, so that's kind of the cool thing here. Uh, so chronic pain, again, that's pain that's going to persist after the injury has been resolved. So uh, a lot of times people will describe, you know, I know for me, you know, I've had some knee injuries, I've had some shoulder injuries. If I describe the pain, it's kind of the same. It's like, yeah, it hurts when I lift over, lift my head, you know, my hands over my head, or it lifts, hurts when I lift something in a certain way. And sometimes it get hurt worse. You're like, man, like, this hurts worse than it did when it first happened, you know? Right. Um, so the description can be similar, and it's also going to give you that stress response. You're still going to go fight or flight. You're going to guard. You're going to protect. But the thing is, is that now we're talking about maladaptive response. We're talking about, you know, uh, I was trying to find a way to describe this without like, you know, being condescending or patronizing. I was like, you know, it's not even that. It's just the best way to describe it is that, you know, there's a fire alarm or your house alarm, your, you know, that goes off, but there's nothing wrong, but then it keeps going off. You know, it's like, all right. right. It's like, hey, there's no emergency. You know, there was some smoke, but we cleared it out. But now the alarm is still going off and it's annoying. Like, I know. We've all had that battery that needs to be changed in a fire alarm and it just won't stop. And you're like, ugh, make it go away. You know, right. so, and that can lead to a, you know, prolonged stress reaction. You know, so now you're constantly in stress. And, you know, if you look at the studies and, you know, look at the books and all that cool stuff, it's like, you know, the longer you're in stress, the more you're at risk of heart disease. You're at more risk of increased illness and reduced immunity, fatigue, depression, anxiety. So it all kind of goes into the cycle. It's a snowball effect. It's, it's such a snowball effect. And so, um, and again, like another difference between acute and chronic pain, you know, chronic pain is more likely to lead to more psychosocial and psych psychiatric effects as well. You know, so we talked about that a little bit, like there is more to it and, you know, how it affects your long-term outlook on life as well. 
So any questions about that? I know I kind of went back and I was trying not to become more luxury on this. Um, no, but I think that it's very, very relevant, you know, to just present to people, you know, that there are those other layers of chronic pain. Cause you know, sometimes when you're listening to a chronic pain segment, it's like, what can we do? How are we treating it? This is what's happening. But what about all those, um, layers that are happen in our mental health when we right. have chronic pain and also yep. what are happening with our relationships with our other loved ones, you right. know, because if you're in chronic pain all the time, how does even your loved one help you? You know what I'm right. saying? When they, when they yeah. can't find the answers at the doctor. So that becomes um, a two way street for feeling mm. sad and depression. It may not even be the person who is experiencing the chronic pain, their caregiver, their loved one who's in their life may be experiencing some of that sadness as well, because there's nothing simple that can be done to change right. that, you know, um, the situation for their loved one. Right, exactly. And that kind of uh, perfectly leads me into the next thing I want to talk about. And, um, you know, one thing that, and this kind of gets into my own personal experience and talking to people who've been in pain and you know, before I even started medical school is that, you know, pain can be lonely. It's a lonely experience, man. And it's subjective, you know, it's like, it's really hard to like, although I may have hurt my back or my knee, mm -hmm. You know, my, it's really hard to find a person that can describe they had that exact pain as you, you know, on that same level of pain, you know, and it may affect their daily lives differently. Right. You know, so, and, it, and again, it's, it's lonely because again, it's like you're, you're in this, you're in your own head, you're, on your, you're in your own space, you know that you're dealing with this. And also like a lot of times in a lot of chronic pain cases, like lab tests, imaging, other studies, they may come back normal and they be like, yeah, there's nothing broken or torn or you know, you don't have a deficiency of anything or an excess of anything. So what's the natural assumption of the person, you know, that you're talking to, whether it be a healthcare professional or a family member, like it must be all in your mind then, you know, if there's right. nothing showing up. Then it's all in your head. Yeah. You know, and, but, but is it though, is it really all in your mind? Because, you know, there's a lot of damage that can be done um, to our nervous system that routine lab tests are not going to find. Mm -hmm. We're just not there yet. We're not at the Star Trek, you know, wave the, you know, device at you and, and determine exactly what's wrong, you know. And um, I don't know if I, I remember if I read this in a book or a movie, but I just, I love this line that, you know, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. You know, just because a normal test result doesn't show that you're in pain, it doesn't mean that it's fake. It doesn't mean that it's, a, right. it's all in your mind. It doesn't mean it's fictitious. It's just that something is going on with you that we just can't detect. You know, and, and the real truth is more nuanced than that. You know, pain can have, you know, we've been talking about this through, you know, it's one of the kind of themes of this is that pain does have a, a physical and a psychological component. And a lot of times the psychological component is just dismissed or it's not acknowledged. It's just like, yeah, you're in pain. We'll just keep doing things until you get better. But are we really doing it? And so, um, and this it is, is you a know, lot of isolation, I, I feel. Oh, man, you know? it is. Yeah, it is. Because um, you don't feel like doing anything. You, you just. Right. You know, and I've been there. There's been a lot of days where I've been, you know, late for class because I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to get out of this bed and I don't want to, mm -hmm. I don't want to start walking and feel this pain or put my, you know, backpack over my shoulder or put my seatbelt on and feel pain. So I'll just sit here, you know, and eventually I convince myself that I'm paying a lot of money for this, get up and go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, you know, it kind of leads to another thing is like, this is, you know, my opinion on it as well. Like, I do feel like one of the things we, one of the best things we can do as, as family members, as friends, and you know, as a future physician is to show that compassion and that empathy and understand that, look, you're in pain and, I, and you are, and I understand it and I acknowledge it is real. And it's the cause of the things that, that are making you unhappy. You know, it's, right. it's easy to be like, oh man, you know, I don't know what it is. Like you have to, I think, understand it. I think once you show a person that you understand, like there's something wrong and you right. get it and you're committed to helping them and you're optimistic about the goals of treatment, you know, like we want to decrease your pain level and we want to improve your quality of life. Like this is a partnership and I'm committed to getting better. I think that, you know, means a lot just for me personally, like right. some of the docs that I've seen in pain, the fact that the ones that have been the most effective are the ones that have been like, you know what? I'm going to be real with you. It's going to take some time and you're going to have to do some work, but this is not the end. You know, it's a lot of the docs who don't really look at you or don't really just, okay, take this and come back in two weeks and tell me how you feel. Whereas like, all right, you know, you're not taking it serious. Right. Um, 
it's and then acknowledgement. We're still I think acknowledgement really. Um, whether you're a family member or whether you're the doctor, you know, letting, you know, your, the person going through the chronic pain know that you acknowledge that they are suffering. You may not know how they're suffering or exactly what mm -hmm. it feels like because maybe they can't even describe exactly what it feels like to you. Um, but that acknowledgement, I think, is key to letting them know that, you know, you're still on their team and, you know, you're working with them and creating hope for them, you know, to get better. Yeah, you know, and we're still advancing, you know, I mean, it's not, it wasn't that long ago where you had a migraine or per, post herpetic neuralgia, they throw you in a psychiatric hospital, like what, you're seeing flashing lights and your ears are ringing and you got a headache and there's nothing, yeah. you know, I don't see anything, you know what, you must be, uh, there's something wrong, so let's treat you for a mental health condition. And it's like, no, I got a migraine, you right. know, so that wasn't 200 years ago. You know, that's more recent than, you know, we like to admit. So, again, we're, we're still advancing. We're still learning. There's so many studies going on about how to address pain. Now, kind of moving forward with that, you know, I think a lot of one of the things that we don't want to take for granted is the role of stress and pain. Um, you know, if you look at some of the studies or just like, you know, people's blogs or their, you know, whatever, you know, writings is that. Yeah. Yeah. So many things yeah, like chronic pain, you know, they, there's a high correlation between pain and increased stress. You know, and I think that stress correlation can make people wrongly assume that the pain is psychological in nature. But then it's like, okay, are you, is stress causing your pain or are you, you know, in, in you know, or you, the stress is after the pain, you know, so right. it's like, okay, is it this or is it after the fact? And that's really a, um, yeah, it's kind of a hard question to answer, you know. Because well, and I think again, sometimes, and I don't mean to interrupt you with no, having no. stress, sometimes when we have a ton of um, stress in our lives, which then make us depressed, which then make us not move, we know how important movement is. So exactly. anyone who doesn't move is going to experience, to start experiencing pain because our bodies right. were meant to move on a daily basis. That's why, you know, when you get hip replacement, they sit you up right mm -hmm. after, less than 24 hours, you're up. <laughs> yep. um, and it's because yeah. of that. So, I mean, I think that you're right. It's, it's a both sides of it. Is the stress causing the pain because of, you know, you're not movement, mm -hmm. depression, or is it the other way around that you have the pain, you know, but it's being even more flourished with the stress? Yeah. And, it, and is that stress a result of the pain itself, whether, you know, the, whether the changes that the pain causes in, in your life, whether it's, you know, distress or disability or, mm -hmm. you know, some of the things we're going to talk about in, in a little while, how they affect, you know, our, our personal relationships. And right. so um, one of the things I was looking at is the, the cycle of stress. And this is, you know, I was talking to you earlier, I was like, man, you know, like I've been looking at this stuff for, you know, over a year now. And I was finding out things about how there's a cycle and how it kind of spirals because you think about nerve pain, you know, so, you know, you get stress, um, just our stress and day, you know, whatever causes you stress, like traffic is my thing. Like I am the calmest person, but like, Four kids driving. driving. <laughs> yeah, driving just sends me there. I've said some really bad things to people in my car, you know, with the windows up and radio loud. But, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's not, a, I have more road annoyance. I don't want to call it rage. It's just more like, ah, you know, I'm not going to do anything crazy. You know, not the time for that. Well, so like you get stressed out, you get increased adrenaline. So that's your fight or flight, you mm -hmm. know, and now that adrenaline is coming from those damaged pain receptors that, you know, not some of the damage it could be in, in case right. of chronic pain and now you've got more stress and now you got more pain and now you're just in this cycle you know where you know is it the stress or is it the damaged pain receptor you know that's you know, leading to more pain but at the end of the day that person feels worse now we think about uh, myofascial or muscular pain where now that tissue that's injured may be hypersensitive to adrenaline so now it's like i'm stressed i put more adrenaline out there now i got a muscle spasm and now it's more tight and it's more painful and now I'm in another vicious cycle, you know? So, and sometimes I wonder, and you talked about like that team approach and I'm like, you know, are we missing a component or a part of chronic pain that we should be addressing by not addressing the stress management piece of it? It's like, okay, you know, I know you're in pain. We're going to do this for treatment, but let's also look at meditation. Let's also look at yoga. Let's look at deep breathing. Let's look at different stress reduction techniques as your body is recovering. And that's a component that I don't, in the future, I don't want to miss that, you know? So. Mm -hmm. All of those things that in more of a natural, holistic way can um, help you and aid. And I have had on the show over the last couple of weeks, some moms that have 
um, kids that were born with, you know, some of the rarest forms of juvenile arthritis and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And they really have moved more over to that holistic, homeopathic, naturopathic approach. Um, but that being said, it's all trial and error. A lot of documentation, a lot of tracking on a daily basis, seeing what works, what doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. But as we know, when we put things into our body on a regular basis, like you know, prescription medications and things like that, we also can alter some of our other organs and the functions of those. So you know, um, the natural approach, you know, is always a great way. So yeah, totally agree. It's good to hear that you know people are looking into it and, and, and researching it more and getting their own answers. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, kind of going forward with some of the, I know you asked these questions a while ago and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I was like, ah, I'm getting there. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so you talked about like, you know, how chronic, how pain can affect a person's life and, you know, how can we help, you know, mm -hmm. what can we do as, as friends, as family and mm -hmm. coworkers, et cetera, et cetera. And so like, I was looking at some statistics sometimes Greg versus the English language statistics. I was looking up those and, and I saw some that really, you know, put an even uh, brighter light on the scope of what people deal with, with their, in, in their pain. So they did a survey. It was back in 2006, but it was the most recent one I can find. Um, it was the Voices of Chronic Pain Survey by the American Academy of Pain Management. Um, and it talked about half the people who responded felt they had little or no control over their pain. It's just like, yeah, I'm in pain. There's nothing I can do about it. You know, and then almost two thirds reported that, OK, this pain impacted their overall enjoyment of life. So you're talking about, you know, 60 percent of the people who responded are like, yeah, I can't enjoy my life because I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. You know, 77 percent felt depressed. Seventy percent said they couldn't concentrate. You know, three fourths of the people said their energy levels down. Eighty six percent. They couldn't sleep like and that's rough, man. And, I, and I've been there. I've, I've you know, tried to sleep. It's try. Have you tried sleeping in pain like? Mm -hmm. really trying to get to sleep when you're hurting there is not a position right. you can get in you know then it wakes you up now you're annoyed mm -hmm. <sighs> angry just think about I it have like, not. my son though i did care for yeah. him after his full spinal surgery yeah, and so rough, sleep for man. about two months um that's rough. real that's real that's not a joke <laughs> yeah no <laughs> no yet. like i um, i kind of yes know, but try to like i'm sorry go ahead <laughs> but you know it um, from that aspect, again, you're looking at the, the loved one caring for someone. So on the flip mm -hmm. side of it, them caring and being up and taking care of um, that mm -hmm. person and just seeing them in that pain, that's a very, um, a very scary feeling when you can't do anything to help someone, you know, to oh, get comfort right. and get sleep and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But no, no sleep for anyone is never a good thing. That's good. I'm sorry I got a little fired up about that, man. Don't mess with my sleep. <laughs> you know, don't mess with my food and my sleep. Don't do it, you know. So. Yeah, your, car, car. your food, your sleep, got it. And exactly, <laughs> and don't touch the radio. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and you, you kind of led me right into that, that I do feel that pain can alter your, the family roles as well. And, and not just, you know, you know, as a parent-child relationship, but just think about, you know, if you're in so much pain that you can't work or you can't, you know, you know take a new job or new position, now you can't contribute financially or you can't help with taking care of other family members or taking care of the home that adds stress to the relationship, you know, because it's like, hey, I've got to do everything because you can't help clean up or you can't right. take the trash out or, you know, that just adds stress to that, you know, and then that leads to, okay, now you know you can't help, but how does this affect your own self-perception? You know, how does it affect your self-esteem if you know that you're not able to contribute to the family dynamic? And then also you mentioned something earlier, it's like, you know, does your spouse or significant other or your children understand chronic pain? Do they know what you're going through? And if they do, are they being too protective? Are they, you know, are they not letting you, you know, do normal daily activities? Or are they kind of babying you? And, you, you know, something that we've learned in uh, one of my classes, the professor would say motion is lotion. Like you've got to keep moving, you know, and you've got to, you know, as you're in the recovery and the rehabilitation phase and moving. But if people are like, oh, no, 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 just sit there. I'll get it. You know, just don't do it. But how can you actually recuperate if you can't move? You know, so there is a, you know, you don't want to, people can assume that they're being helpful and they're being caring and they are and it means so well, but what you don't want them doing is promoting further you know, disability and dysfunction right. by kind of just putting the kid gloves on you, you know, so. Right, you need to push them. Yeah, it's, exactly. Just a little bit. Not too much, you know, don't, you know, get it. Don't, don't tell them to block or anything, but. Yeah, don't do too much. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, I'm not going to, can't help you lift furniture, but I can, you know, mm. lift some smaller things, you know? 
Um, and then also kind of going along with that is does the pain lead to job loss? You know, and this kind of, if you can't work and you know, quitting a job or getting fired now, you know, this can also affect your self-worth and your self-esteem and your, your self, your sense of purpose. And then also we talk about that loneliness and isolation is like, you know, there is a lot of social support and friendship developed by going to work or going to school or, you know, being part of a group or a community. And you lose that when that pain prevents you from doing other things. Mm -hmm. A lot of isolation. Yeah, it is. It is. And so, um, all right. I know I'm kind of going here. It's been about, is my time up? Are we good? I was not up. Is, is anyone on here? So, <laughs> I, I, they'll, yeah. be watching it. they'll be watching it on the replay. No worries on that. So I won't. I told you earlier, I'll never watch this. I'll never see this. So if people say mean things, I won't even know. I'm just going to live my life oblivious of this whole thing. So I'll even tell people, don't tell me. If you didn't like it, just, just, you know, just nod your head at me. So, um, and another thing we kind of were talking about the mental health effect a little bit too. And, um, and I thought about this, you know, as, as a student clinician is like a lot of the patients that I've seen for chronic pain, it's like, wow, they're also on antidepressants. And it's like, that is a lot. And I just started thinking about the correlation between the two of the association. And even in the studies, they show that 40% of the uh, patients with chronic pain also suffer from clinical depression. That's almost half. That's a lot. Right. You know, and, and the thing is, is the problem with that is it goes back to that, you know, that cycle and what's causing what. So is a depression a consequence of living in chronic pain, you know, versus the cause of the pain? And it's not necessarily proof that, you know, that psychological distress is the root cause. But I think there is a responsibility to address both, you know. So it's like you can't say, OK, you're depressed because so that's making your pain worse. Or your pain is making the depression worse. It's like, hey, it's there. You can't ignore it but understand that it leads to that. And just like all the things we said before about not being able to work and your family interactions. And it's, man, it's, it hurts, man, to just feel like you don't, you know, personal experience is like, man, you just don't want to do it. You're just like, man, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm done. You know, I'm done. And that's I'm what I think gonna... the, the team approach is so, mm -hmm. it's so important when we talk about pain management and chronic pain and really putting together your team, you know, your, your medical team, your, whether it's, you know, naturopathic medicine or whether it's our, you know, conventional medicine, whether it's those outside people that are your massage therapist and your acupuncture, you know, and, and do other outside modalities too, mm -hmm. but putting together that team. So you have all those different layers. And um, I definitely think for the mental aspects of it, that I love what they've done um, and, you know, being in Wisconsin Children's Hospital, Wisconsin is one of the, you know, top notch mm -hmm. kids hospitals in the United States, really that whole team approach of having psychiatrists and psychologists and everybody on board is so comprehensive for you to look at where those aspects are coming from and making sure that someone's not being treated, you know, or is, or the treatment is not working for them. And why are we not changing right. sooner before anything happens with that? So, right. um, I think that that's, that's great. The more that I've heard this last, like I said, this last couple of weeks is that it seems that many doctors um, of all, on all sides of things, um, and even like just chiropractors really are taking that whole, the whole person approach, like you're talking about and really looking at all of those, you know, all of those things. Exactly. And that's so important. And, um, you know, I was just thinking about it as, as you were talking, I was like, man, you know, I, um, I know I'm not getting into a lot of the, the nitty gritty. And I talked about that with you earlier. I was like, yeah, you know, I don't want this to the same, you know, I can get on here and tell you all about the prostaglandins and the cytokines and the axonal reactions and substance P and CGRP and, you know, all the acronyms in the world. But like, you know, is that really going to help people that are not in, 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 in healthcare understand what's going on? Right. So if I'm not being tactful enough, this is the time to tell me. So I oh can, no, no, I'm ready. You know what it is is that really yeah. so much of so much of the learning process comes from real life. You know mm -hmm. what's happening in real life. So somebody can yeah. say, you know, also that this worked. But as we know, you know, anything that you try is probably going to work for one out of ten people. You know, right. or you know, even less. And it's trying different yeah. things and realizing that you know, real life is that you feel isolated. Real life yeah. is that you're if you're in a relationship or you're a caregiver, you feel mm -hmm. isolated. You know, um, yeah, that depression yeah. accompanies that, that self, you know, lowering of self-worth and self-esteem accompanies that on both ends of it. So I think that, mm -hmm. you know, I love what you have spoken to about that, you know, cause that's yeah. so relevant in all of this yeah. and it's, it's real. 
Yeah, it is. And again, I, I also uh, acknowledge that, you know, if I were giving this um, presentation to like my, my colleagues or, you know, a class or something like that, you know, that's more of where you're getting into the nitty gritty and more of the, um, you know, the biochemical aspects of it. But for this, I was like, you know what, I just, because this for me is not, you know, it's great to talk and be able to talk to your listeners. But this was, again, like I was telling you earlier, this is a great experience for me because it's kind of, it's helped me kind of, you know, change my perspective on pain as well. Because, you know, I have an engineering background and like, I can be very binary in a lot of ways. Like, okay, here's the thing, fix that. Everything gets better when I do this one thing. You know, when I find the circuit that's bad or I find the, the relay that's incorrect or something like that or the valve or whatever have you let's fix that everything's good after that but that's just not how the body works and right. how the mind works so um and that's why it's so important to you know obviously getting through med school and all the training we do that part it's not easy don't get me wrong but it's a little bit more straightforward than looking at the whole person good segue there so you know some of the complications of chronic pain is not just the pain itself it's not just the functional changes, but again, it's the psychosocial effects. It's the impact on a sense of purpose. So that kind of leads into like, how do we address that? You know, how do we help people? And so I like to look at it from a perspective of mind, body, and spirit. You know, so for the mind, you know, you think about, I was talking about earlier how those studies show that 70% of the people with chronic pain have concentration issues. It affects memory as well. And the feeling of the sensation of mental or physical fatigue. You know, so now it's like you're tired, you can't think, you can't remember anything. So how are you going to engage in activities that require sustained mental effort? As you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. You know, so and how do you stay engaged? You know, how do you keep stimulated while in pain? Because my personal experience is there have been times, it happened today, like I was focused on something in school. I'm dealing with some back pain right now. And one of my classmates said something to me, and I just hopped out of the chair, just walked over there like faster than I've moved in weeks. And she's like, wow, what you look great like what was that i was like oh i didn't even think about it you know because my mind was so focused on what we were doing in class and what you know what i was thinking about i was thinking about this here today and i just didn't think about the pain i was in so there is i feel some benefit in mental stimulation while you're recovering from pain um you mentioned before about you know not moving and how that can you know lead to you know long or worse ramifications but right. you're right so without movement without normal daily activities you know, those muscles, those ligaments, those tendons, those, those joints, those bones can weaken and become further disabled. So how do we get that person moving? How do we motivate them to move? You know, because again, depending on your level of pain, you might not just want to do it. You just don't mm -hmm. have the energy or the desire to get moving. But if you talk to a physical therapist, they talk about how there's thresholds and it's like, hey, I know this is painful, but we're going to do it and we're going to keep getting you better because you got to retrain the body to move and overcome pain. So right. it's kind of like the workout thing too. It's like, are right, you work out, you get to a certain weight, it's tough. And the next time you do it, you're able to handle it better. And so it's how do we encourage them to understand that movement is important. Right. And then the last part of it is the spiritual aspect. And, and, I, and I, when I say spirit, I don't want to like say, you know, depending, I'm not whatever religion people are, that's great. And I'm not here to, I'm not here imposing my religious beliefs on anyone, but I do find that, um, that with social isolation, and with the pain that comes or the, you know, the social isolation that comes with pain is that your family, your friends, people find it difficult to even talk to you about it, you know, to find topics to discuss and activities to engage in without the center of attention becoming the pain without, because if you're in pain, it's so like this flashing red light on you. It's hard not to talk about it. It's hard not to be like, hey, we're walking right. to the store or going to a restaurant. It's like, oh, it hurts when I sit down and I can't get comfortable. Right. And you're trying not to make your pain the center of attention but it is the center of attention for you you know so does this lead to spending more time alone people not asking you to do things does it, does it put you on a path to depression you know and with that do we seek a deeper or more spiritual meaning to our pain so not just spirit in the religious sense but our spirit our sense of well-being how does it affect that right. you know and then that's a big question i you know it's like i've asked it of myself like why is this happening to me like i've worked out mm -hmm. i've never had a major injury like why am i in pain what have i done you know mm -hmm. what's the meaning in this pain and so again are we missing the boat on addressing and not addressing that person's search for meaning and faith and their spiritual needs whether it be uplift or spirit and religious in a religious sense so i think that's something we don't want to ignore as well yeah. breath time <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I think that um, the mind, body, and spirit is so important. We have we have touched on that lightly in different ways over the last um, couple of weeks of, you know, our mind, when we can take our mind away from our pain, and so whether that's you focusing on um, a lecture coming up or, you know, a next class or even, you know, meditation, music, you know, things that we can focus our mind on um, so much of the time benefits that and the body and definitely spiritual in both ways. I think mm -hmm. is beneficial, you know, and providing yourself hope because if you feel horrible every day and you don't keep the faith and have hope, what is there? If you don't hope mm -hmm. that tomorrow is going to be better, if you don't hope that, you know, maybe this new thing you're going to try is going to work, then what do you really have? Mm -hmm. Not much. That's so cool. I feel like I shared my screen with you because literally the next thing I was going to talk about was hope. Like <laughs> didn't we didn't set this up. I promise you. I'm like, wow, she's, it's happening now. Before it was, now it's happening. Mm. Um, but we found some synergy here. We got this. Um, so again, hope's important. And I think one of my goals as, as a future physician, when I deal with, you know, patients with chronic pain and I help them is that, you know, not just finding the cause and addressing the nutritional deficiencies and the structural imbalances, all the medical school things. That's great. And I love it. Mm -hmm. But I hope that I'm also able to, you know, convey the understanding and, and hope that they need to get better. I'm ho I hope that you know, I'm at a position in the future where it's like, you know what, hey, when that person is sitting across from me, they understand that I, you know, I know they're in pain and there is a possible, real, not just possibility, but a realistic possibility for improvement and to empower them to envision a life without pain, you know, and, and not just life without pain, where a life where pain is not the center of their world, it's not the driving force in how, in mm -hmm. how they live their life, you know, because pain isn't just something that happens to us. I don't feel that pain is a punishment. So it's about reframing the experience. It's about, you know, fighting that sense of hopelessness and fighting that sense of helplessness and, you know, and not allowing ourselves to be a victim of pain. And that for me has been one of the keys in overcoming a lot of things I've done is that, you know what, I'm not going to be a victim of this. I'm going to work at it. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, there's some things I can't do, but never losing sight of that there is a way to get better. It's just going to take some time, you know, but you have to be willing to commit to that and understand it and not give up, you know, so. That's the main thing, you know. Amen. <laughs> That's what I have to say to that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just can't give up. You know, it's easy to want to do it, but you just, right. you just can't, you know. Right. Yeah. So I know that we're going to make this into a part two where we're going to come up with different, obviously, modalities and strategies and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but are you, do you think that you have wrapped up for this first part of this segment? I think so. I think people, okay. are I think they're tired. I'm tired. <laughs> So, <laughs> and it's Friday, but it is yeah. only what is it by you? It's only two o'clock. See, here it's almost time that everyone's getting out of work because it's almost it's four o'clock already on a Friday. So, yeah, no, it's cool. I, I hope that, um, I hope that people who will take the time to listen to this or a couple minutes of this, they can, you know, get a different opinion on. Because, again, um, what I wanted to stress was that with this talk was, um, was that is that there's just more to the science part of pain, mm -hmm. you know, there's more to, you know, like. There's so many books and there's so many studies about how, you know, how inflammation affects pain and um, neurotransmitters and the nervous system and peripheral nerves and right. superficial nerves. That stuff's out there in blood flow. And I love talking about that stuff. But I just don't want, you know, I never want to become, you know, the doctor in the future that only looks at that and doesn't understand that there's more to it than that right. part of the story. You know, I think that's, it's important for people to know that there is the physical part of it and there's a psychological part of it i think that we need to you know to show our loved ones that we care and that when we get better we can we can understand it as two parts to it and so if i had to kind of have a takeaway um, or you know give people a takeaway is you know when it comes to pain you know be patient with yourself be patient with your body be patient with your loved ones and while we're at it just you know be patient with each other you know this is kind of off topic, but it's something I feel is important. This is just me. You can edit this out as we come through. But I just feel that, you know, when it comes to being patient with each other, is embracing our differences, embracing our diversity. Because I feel like, you know, a world full of love and, and respect is way less painful than a world full of anger and hate and ignorance. And you mm -hmm. can't wait on some politician or someone to change it for you. We got to start changing one of ourselves, you know, and, and understand that's also going to take time but it can't be just sitting back and hoping things are going to get better. It, it starts from us, just like pain management does. It starts in here, man. So. Right. 
you can edit that I love out. It. That's just no, me. I love it. I love it. I love it. All yeah. right. So on that, I want to thank you guys all for listening in this afternoon, or if you're catching it on the replay, I want to thank you, Greg. This has been awesome. And I can't wow. wait to have you on again. And with that, if you are looking for any of our YouTube tutorial videos, other podcasts, or any of our other social media applications or information, you can go on over to www onairadvocate.com. Also, please remember that June 1st kicks off our private On Air Advocate community on Facebook. So make sure that you hop on over there to request to be a part of that. So with that, Greg, you have an amazing weekend. Thank you for sharing your time, talents, and energy with all of uh, us. Hey, uh, I forgot to show my picture. I didn't show my picture. I, oh. I drew it and I didn't show it. This is the oh. pain. Picture. I just dropped my phone. I just dropped the phone. Oh my god! I think I just turned it off. Am no, I still on? No. I... No, you're on. You're off. This is the best. Oh my part god. Right oh my god. What is happening right now? Okay, here we go. All right, I got okay. my. Oh, it dropped again. This is this is great. This is definitely getting edited out. So <laughs> I, I drew this picture and it's backwards. I give up. But one was a no, show like it. we he, can see it forwards. We can see it. Yeah. Forwards. Oh, you can. And yeah. there was. This, I get, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm going to stop right now. This is bad. Okay. This is so, so bad. It was going so well. But I also wanted to say, um, I know if you guys want to keep up with me and my yes. trials and tribulations of med school uh, on Instagram, it's under Jim Jones 74. That's G Y M Jones 74. Um, also Nature's Warriors USA, which is my, uh, this is great. You love how I'm ex like, I feel like it's an award show and the music's <laughs> playing, but I'm still talking until the, the credits roll, roll the credits. And uh, Nature's Warriors USA is a company that I'm starting, and uh, uh, I'm really into developing uh, natural supplements, and especially for athletes that don't have all the artificial stuff in there that are you know, evidence-based and all that. And it's something I've been working on for years. So we have a logo. We have wristbands. I got a plan. Nice. It's all going to happen in the future. That's so awesome. And, so uh, I'm going to actually – so is it fine if I drop your Facebook and your um, Instagrams? below or what would you like yeah let's do that let's do that because i'll keep going i'll keep going no you i'm know, gonna drop them below go bears go bulls yeah no no bears. <laughs> and i'm a giants fan so i'm not a, right. i'm sorry I, packers are lovely but i am a new york giants fan um okay. not a bears fan though i don't know that I've ever, i mean i did like walter payton a lot i mean now we're on a completely different subject <laughs> it's all good it's all good trust me it's all a right. painful life being a bears fan trust me speaking of <laughs> speaking of pain <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm going to drop all of your social media links below so people can follow you, check in with you. Also, on this live, um, I'm going to make sure that Greg checks if there are any questions or comments or things that he mm -hmm. needs to address. We'll get back to that as well. So as okay. always, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And you guys have a fabulous weekend. Thanks again. God bless. Thanks. Bye.